Psalm 106, and beginning right there at the beginning of the psalm. We read this, uh, Praise ye the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can show forth all his praise? Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor that thou bearest unto thy people. O visit me with thy salvation, that I may see the good of thy chosen, that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, that I may glory with thine inheritance. Lord, it's good to be here tonight. I thank you for Sunday Night Church. Again, Lord, all it's meant to me in my life since being saved, I, I appreciate it very much. I pray that you'd uh, do something um, in our midst and something in uh, each and every person's heart and life. Um, I pray you'd equip them with uh, some things that will, will help them get some victory, help them to uh, grow, help them to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Uh, take uh, control, Lord, over these next few moments. <clears throat> help me as I speak and these as they hear. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> so tonight I'm going to bring you a message about um, this subject, things that affect your morality. Uh, the first five verses of Psalm 106, which we read tonight, they, they can be outlined into five points. All those five points we're going to I'm going to tell you about are, are not directly corresponding uh, with each verse, as one per each verse. Uh, these five points are not the uh, points of the message, but by way of introduction, I'm just going to go over them with you real quick and, and uh, give you the outline and explain it. So in, uh, verse, in the beginning of uh, verse number one, uh, what we have is a command. Um, look, at it, look what he says in verse number one, Psalm 106, verse one. Praise uh, ye the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good... Uh, for his mercy endureth forever. Uh, so looking just the first part, praise ye the Lord, O give thanks, Lord. We have a command. Actually, we have two commands. Praise ye the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord. And you're supposed to do that. So uh, just stop and think as we start tonight. Uh, do you do that in your life? Do you praise him? Do you thank him? You ought to do that. That's what the Lord tells you to do here. Um, in verse number two, at the or, or rather the second point at the end of verse number one is this. For he... In, for he is good for his mercy endureth forever. And what we have there is a declaration. And again, actually, we have two declarations. And that is, he is good. That's a declaration about the Lord. And his mercy endureth forever. And uh, uh, folks, those are just uh, facts. That's plain truth. God is good. Um, and, and that's important to know. You know. There's a lot of people that don't think he's good. They, they look at what's going on in the world and they have the, you know, they have the audacity to just uh, lash out against God and blame it on him. When, it's, uh, when the problem is with man, uh, but uh, they, they don't think he's good, but God is good. You can always trust that, and his mercy endureth forever. Aren't you glad you got in on his mercy? Amen. And if you haven't gotten in on it, uh, isn't it about time you did? It'll endure forever. You'll be eternally safe and secure. The third point uh, we find in verse number two, and what we have there is a question. Well, I guess I should just go ahead and tell you, actually, two questions. Verse number uh, two. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can show forth all his praise? That's a question. It's just laid out there, open-ended. But the next point, which comes in the next verse, we actually have um, an answer. And you might have guessed it, actually. Two answers. Verse number uh, three. Or verse number, uh, yeah, verse number three, the answer to the question, verse number two. Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. So they are blessed, but that is also the answer to the question that he was uh, talking about. The ones that can utter his mighty acts, the ones that can show forth his praise, are the ones that keep judgment and the ones that do righteousness at all time. Uh, when you do righteousness at all time, you give a demonstration. You show, you uh, give an example, a living example of somebody that uh, and shows forth uh, his praise. By doing right. So, so you got the questions, you got the answers. And then in verses four and five, the last point that you'd have here is uh, it's a request. And I won't say two requests. We'll just make it one request, but it's all, it's multifaceted. But uh, look at the prayer and the request in verse number five. He says, that I may see the good of thy chosen, that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, that I may glory uh, with thine inheritance. Uh, I guess I started in verse number five. I should have started in verse number four, remember me, O Lord, with the favor that thou, thou uh, bearest unto thy people. O visit me with thy salvation, again, that I may see the good of thy chosen, and that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, 
that I may glory with thine inheritance. So a bunch of things in there, but, but what he's really getting down to uh, that, that he wants is he wants the Lord's blessing. Notice in verse number four, he says, Remember me, O Lord, with the favor that thou uh, bearest unto thy people. Favor is a word that is used to define uh, blessing, uh, God's favor upon someone. Notice in the next verse, he says, that I may see the good of thy chosen. The good of thy chosen, that's just, you know, when God's goodness is bestowed upon you, his blessings are upon you. That is the Lord giving you of his blessing. So, so what the psalmist is requesting from the Lord really is for God to bless him. And while it's certainly a, a good thing to pray for the Lord uh, to bless you, and it's a right thing to pray for the Lord to bless you, um, there are some things that you can do to incur his blessing in your life, and blessings, plural. And that's what verse 3 is all about. Verse 3 said this, blessed are they. So what's going to follow is some things that will incur the Lord's blessing. Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. Now I want you to especially look at the last part of that. The one that gets blessed is the one that does righteousness at all times. Now at the beginning uh, tonight, I just told you a few moments ago, that the message is on this, things that affect your morality. Uh, the word morality is not in the Bible. The word moral and the word morals, uh, no form of that word morality is in the scriptures. And as I thought about preaching on this subject, I thought there must be a word in the Bible that would be synonymous with uh, morality. And uh, considering this, um, the Lord seemed to put it into my mind that uh, the word righteousness would, uh, would co it'd go along and, and coincide with the word uh, morality. And... Uh, and, and that makes sense because that's what we're describing. When we're describing morality, we're describing righteousness. Or if you're describing <clears throat> what righteousness is, somebody that possesses righteousness would have morality in the best sense of the word. Um, after considering it and after coming to the conclusion, uh, out of curiosity, I decided to go ahead and look it up in my uh, Rajay's thesaurus and uh, looked up the word morality. And sure enough, one of the words they gave was righteousness. So um, I, I trust the Lord was, was, was putting that in uh, my mind there. But uh, when we find that word here, righteousness, in Psalm 106, verse 3, what I want you to notice is the fact that God's blessing is upon the one that does righteousness at all times. Uh, go over to Psalm 119. And look at the beginning of Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse number one. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Again, you will incur God's blessing by doing right, by being undefiled, by walking uh, according to his word. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. Again, it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and verse three follows up. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. This kind of a person will be blessed. And your morality or your lack thereof has a tremendous effect on your life. Um, it is to your own benefit that you will live a moral life. It is to your own detriment if you will live an immoral life. And with that as a backdrop, what I want to talk to you about again, and the purpose of this message is to give you some instruction, to impart to you some understanding that there are some things that can affect, that can have an effect on your morality, either for good or bad. Now, it might be that you have some of these things uh, in your life already that are, and they're actually making it more difficult for you to live a moral, righteous life. And in such a case, you've had some that have some of the wrong things in there. By eliminating them, you give yourself a real boost towards doing right. It can be like, if you eliminate those things, it can be like breaking free from chains that are holding you back from living a victorious Christian life and incurring the blessing of God upon your life. Um, additionally, by incorporating some things that can affect you for good your, when it comes to your morality, uh, you can actually make it easier for you to do right. Um, and, and when I talk about doing right, you understand that I'm talking about not by the world standards, but doing right in the sight of the Lord. And so I'm going to give you tonight, I'm going to give you uh, three things. We're going to cover three categories of things that can affect your morality for good or bad. Now, Again, these three things might already be affecting your morality for good or bad. And when I say your morality, what I mean is um, uh, your, your morality encompasses both your moral practice as well as your moral outlook, how you 
perceive things, what you perceive to be right or wrong. Because everybody's got their own opinions, but only one person's opinion matters, and that's the Lord's. But there's things that you can have in your life that can make it easier for you to understand what's right and wrong and easier for you to, easier for you to do right. And there's some things you can have in your life that make it more difficult for you to do right and that also cause you to have a wrong understanding of what's right and what's wrong. So we're going to give you three categories, starting with this. Uh, first thing that can affect your morality, I'm going to talk to you about tonight, uh, are your friends and companions. Now, your friends and companions can affect you for good or for bad when it comes to your moral understanding and your moral behavior. Uh, there is a classic verse on this in the scriptures. To me, it's a classic verse on this in the scriptures that every young person ought to memorize. And for that matter, there's a lot of not so young people that ought to memorize this as well. And that verse is Proverbs chapter 13 and verse number 20. Uh, go with me to that verse. I won't ask you if you already have it memorized, but um, I want to encourage you, if you don't, to, to go ahead and work on committing it to memory. Especially if you're a, a young person. Or if you're not a young person and you think you're a young person. <laughs> or if you just need it. Uh, Proverbs 13 and verse number 20. Some of us like to still think we're young people, but certain things tell us we're not. Uh, Proverbs 13, 20. Here's the verse. Real simple, right to the point, really easy to understand. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. All right? You're walking with wise men. Uh, the people that you walk with, as they say in the modern vernacular, are the people that you hang with, right? They're the people that you hang out with. Uh, a companion is, uh, or, or one of your companions is somebody that you keep company with, you spend time with. Again, a, a friend or companion. I say friends and companions because sometimes you might have companions, people you hang around with that you don't really consider friends, but you hang around with them. Either way, uh, these folks can have an influence on your life for good or for, for bad. Uh, they can rub off on you. You'll notice the first part of the verse, the one that walks with wise men is going to be wise. Why? Why? Because their wisdom rubs off on you. On the other hand, the companion of fools shall be destroyed. So I can help my ability uh, to be blessed by making sure to hang around with good people. I hang around with wise men, uh, then I can, I can get some wisdom from them by rubbing shoulders with them, and it can rub off on me. But if I make myself a companion of fools, then you know when judgment falls on them, I'm getting, getting it on me as well. You know, if you're hanging around with fools and a bomb drops on the fool and you're pretty close to him, well, it can blow you to pieces as well. And so a companion of fools will be destroyed. Moreover, the more you hang around with them, the more you act like them. You know, they say birds of a feather flock together. And people tend to hang around with, with folks that, that are like them. Um, and, and they gravitate to people that are like them. But if even if you're not that way, if you start hanging around that way, you can become that way. Um, there's a, a classic little book we have in our church library uh, called uh, Turkeys and Eagles. And in that book, Turkeys and Eagles, if you never read it, it's a good, good little read. The first half of it is uh, kind of like a parable story, and then the application's made uh, afterward. And, and in that story, this eagle um, somehow winds up being uh, raised by uh, a turkey. So I don't know if I can't remember if the egg was abandoned or whatever, but um, he hatched and he's hanging around a bunch of turkeys. And as he's hanging around those turkeys, as he grows up, he thinks he's a turkey. Now he, get, he gets a little bigger and he begins to look different than a turkey and they realize something different. But you know what he did? He behaved like a turkey, you know? He looked for his food by, you know, pecking at the ground for the grubs and stuff like the turkey did, act like a turkey. And um, as time goes on, eventually uh, somebody lets him know he's an eagle. And, and guess what you can do? You can soar up there to that. And finally, he breaks free from his turkey behavior. Because why do you act like a turkey? Because that's who he hung around with. He was raised with, with turkeys. And, and sometimes you got to remember, Christian, um, you know, you are not like the turkeys of the world. No, no offense on uh, the turkey, so to speak. <laughs> but um, what, you, what you are is you're a saint. You're a child of God. You got, uh, as far as a bird, you got the Holy Spirit, wings like a dove, and you're different than this world. If you hang around like this world, you're going to act like the, this world. Now, while, uh, again, he talks about companion fools at the end of the verse, going to be destroyed. Now, while we are to minister to this lost world, 
you got to be careful not to make them uh, your best friends. We're to minister to lost sinners, and we are to minister to carnal Christians as well, but they should not comprise our best friends, and they should not be our constant companions. Unless you are supernaturally strong, and, and, and don't deceive yourself into thinking you are when you're not. Unless you are supernaturally strong, supernatural like the power of God, unless you're supernaturally strong, it is easier for someone to pull you down than it is for you to pull them up. Uh, let, let me illustrate this. I, I, I'd like to get somebody big and strong, but um, I'll settle for Noah. <laughs> you come up and help me. He's big. Now, Noah... Whatever you do, don't ruin this illustration. <laughs> All right, you, you get up here, and he's already taller than me, but now he towers over me. And if we're going to, we lock hands, and what we're going to do is you're going to try to pull me up, and I'm going to try to pull you down. All right? All right? So you're kind of right on the edge there. Uh, I got some lever. Let's go. Go ahead. You can try. Did you try? Not really. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's go. All right. Let's go. Ready? Go. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, look, turnabout's fair play. All right. Now, let's go. I'm up and you're down and you're going to try to pull me down. I'm going to try to pull you up. All right. Ready? Go. I did have to let up a little bit to let him get me. <laughs> so that's the point. You can go sit. We think sometimes that we can pull other people up and we're just not strong enough to do it. And I, I realize you can get to a place where you're stronger, but you make those kind of folks your constant companions and they're going to pull you down. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse 33. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. By the way, don't miss the first three words of that verse. Be not deceived. It's real easy to be deceived by it. Think, well, I can handle it. I'm strong. It ain't, ain't going to bother me. But, but he says, don't be deceived about it because evil communications corrupt good manners. <clears throat> Excuse me. And one of the easiest ways to apply that is, again, by the people that you hang out with. You hang out with the wrong folks, and they will rub off on you. Um, I used to, as a kid, sometimes I get to go over and stay overnight with my cousins. They lived out in the country, and uh, it just was, it was a different atmosphere out there. And, and there's a little bit different situation. We're out there. There's less supervision. They had, it wasn't a city where you had neighbors. They had a big place where really they had different houses around, but uh, they're all their relatives that lived on this, these, in these houses and in uh, a farm just uh, past them, which their you know, grandpa uh, ran. And so, you know, we got to run around, do what we wanted. And you no, know, the morals were more loose. The language out there was more consistently corrupt. And you know, you, I, I would, I'd spend the night, hang around there, and I remember coming home, and my mom would say, it'd take me, you know, a day or two just to get kind of get back to my normal good behavior. I don't, not that I was real good, but at that point, I was behaving well. <laughs> but but it, would take, it, would, it would take me a little get, while to get back to behaving well. Uh, when I was in the morally looser environment, I just began to behave like they did, rubbed off of me, talked like they did, behaved like they did. And when I got back home away from that um, influence, eventually I would gravitate to a, a better behavior. Uh, again, not that we were the great Christians in our home, but we grew up, uh, grew up in the Catholic Church and we had the world in there as well. But, but um, you know, there's, I guess, levels of how far down you, you're going to go. And so I learned from that, you know, now that I'm saved and, and, and I learned that um, you hang around the wrong people, it's going to rub off on you. You hang around the right people, that's going to rub off on you. So choose your friends wisely because one way or another, they're going to rub off on you for better or for worse. Uh, you hang around the mangy dogs, you're going to get fleas. You hang around with moral pigs, you're going to eventually be eating the same slop that they do. It just happens. Now, I, I know there's many a person just started hanging around people for fun and they thought, I'll never do what they do. And, and, and I've had this, the same thing. I'll never do this or I'll never be that. 
And after hanging around them for a while, guess what? I did it and I was it. And so you don't want to hang around the wrong folks and get the wrong influence. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Amazing how much the Bible really has to say about these things. Ephesians chapter number 5, verse 11. Ephesians 5, verse number 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. As you hang around the wrong people, they can bring you down. And that's what he's talking about. You, you don't have fellowship with them. All right. You might minister to them a bit. You might uh, work with them a bit, but you can't make them your best friends if you want to, to do right, because it's going to rub off on you. I, again, old, old story, but I, uh, even the guy that helped me to get saved, the, the friend of mine who helped me, who led me to the pastor, who led me to the Lord after hanging around for him a little while after he got saved, you know, he started backsliding and, and, you know, was having struggles. And I had to make a conscious decision uh, to break fellowship with them. I remember we were out bike riding, a long bike ride, and I kind of just kind of began to kind of hang back, let them get ahead, and I was just thinking and talking to the Lord about what I needed to do. And I realized, I, you know, as much as I appreciate him and, and love him as a, bro a brother in the Lord, and he was a help to me, at this time, he's dragging me down. And I had to break fellowship uh, for a time with him until such a time when, um, you know, he got back um, doing, doing well again. And sometimes you got to make those hard decisions. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians 6. Verse 14. Now, think about the words. This is a passage that for some people might be, oh, yeah, yeah, I heard that. Been there. Listen to what he's saying and see how it might affect your life. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So again, your best friends ought not to be lost people. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And, and, and by the way, some people that are saved or best to be saved, they might be in the unrighteous category as far as their practical Christian living is concerned. So what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? They, they don't get along. Um, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, or what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. You see what God wants you to be? He wants you to be clean. Feels good to be clean, by the way. And you're to come out from among the unrighteous, separate yourselves, and not to become a Pharisee and think you're better than everybody else, but to keep yourself clean for your Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. You'll have a better, closer relationship with the Lord as you do that. All right, go back to the Old Testament, Proverbs chapter number 9. Proverbs 9. Proverbs chapter 9, verse number 6. One more time. Forsake the foolish and live, and go in the way of understanding. The foolish will lead you out of the way of understanding. As you forsake them, you can then more easily go in the way of understanding. All right, back it up to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 63. Back in our... Uh, the original classic verse I talked talk to you about, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, and a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Again, now we'll talk about the first part of that in conjunction with um, Psalm 119, verse 63. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. It'll rub off on you. And the psalmist got that, and so he says in Psalm 119, verse 63, I am a companion of all them that fear thee and them that keep thy precepts. And that's the kind of people you want to hang around with, the ones that fear the Lord the ones that uh, love the Lord, the ones that trying to do right, you want the Lord's blessing, uh, you hang around th those people. You hang around those people, they tend to rub off on you, and as you live right and do right, you incur the Lord's blessing. Who you hang around with, your friends and, and companions, can affect you morally 
and affect your morality for good or for evil. But then, and so it's up to you. The choice is yours. Make, make wise decisions. It's, it's isn't it a blessing to have a free will. I mean, sometimes it'd be nice if the Lord just forced us to do right in our brains, which is supposed to make the right choices. But he gives us the free will because he wants us to choose to do right. And you can choose. And you will bear, you will bear the results of the choices that you make. That's what your life is. It's a, it's a series of choices. You make good choices, you get good blessings. You make bad choices, it's going to be rough. And, and even if you make good choices, it doesn't mean that everything's going to be 100% beautiful, perfect, in your life down here, you'll still have troubles and trials and tribulations because we're not in heaven yet. But Lord will make up for it up there. You know, down here on this earth, you suffer one way or the other. You do right, um, you're going to get uh, persecution and trouble from your adversary, and you're going to you're going to suffer. You do wrong, you're, you're going to get trouble from just the reaping what you sowed. And if you're saved, you know God taking you out to the woodshed. There, there's suffering down here for everybody. The thing about the suffering that you get for doing right comes to an end. And when that suffering comes to an end, God will reward you for it if you've taken it properly up in heaven. But if you just continue to do wrong and, you know, you get whipped right and left and you keep doing wrong and you never get things right, uh, you're going to have to answer for it again when you get up there. Minimize your suffering, folks. <laughs> do right. And uh, if you suffer for that, then praise the Lord and, and handle it right and let him reward you for it both now and later. All right, something else that can affect your morality is, strangely enough, your diet. And by diet, I mean what you eat and what you drink. Now, last Sunday night, we talked just a, a, we talked a bit about diet, really last Sunday night, in the message regarding renewing your youth from Psalm 103 and verse number 5. And just like your diet can affect your physical health for good or for bad, your diet can affect your moral health for good or for bad. Uh, Job, you know, in the scripture, he was a very moral man. In Job 1 and verse number 1, it says that he was perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. Job said an interesting thing uh, in his book. Go there with me, if you would, to Job chapter 6. In chapter 6, at the end of uh, that chapter, um, he says something I, I find to be interesting. The wording, we'll start in verse 29. Job 6 and verse 29. Return, I pray you, let it not be iniquity. Yea, return again, my righteousness is in it. Is there iniquity in my tongue? Cannot my taste discern perverse things? Cannot my taste? That's just, a, just something to think about, isn't it? There are perverse things that can be put in a person's mouth. Job says, my, my taste can discern those perverse things. And he was talking literally about his tongue uh, right at the beginning of the verse. There are perverse things that you can put in your mouth that will have an effect on you um, for bad. Those perverse things will. There, some of the food that you eat can tune you so much into your flesh that it actually makes it harder for you to say no to sin. You get yourself so hopped up on some things that you eat, and it can be hard to just say no uh, to things that the other things that the flesh wants. Uh, it's a known fact that there are some things that you can drink that can make it harder for you to say no to sin. And our diet consists of what we eat and what we drink. On the other hand, um, good food and good drink can actually make it easier for you to discipline yourself to do right. Uh, there is food that you can eat that will actually have a bearing on your moral understanding and your ability to live a moral life. Um, and again, my, my claim is this, that your diet, what you eat, what you drink, can affect your moral health for good or for bad. Now, I'm not just making this up because it sounds good. Uh, I'm going to give you an example uh, of each. We'll look at one example of each. We'll look at more than one place, but one example of each of these things. One that can, uh, something in your diet that can affect you for bad, another thing that can affect you for good. So when it comes to affecting you for bad, go to Proverbs 23. And here, the person is, uh, is drinking something that's going to have a bad effect on them. And of course, you uh, would no doubt understand that what he's drinking um, is going to be liquor. 
alcohol. And in Proverbs 23, verse number 29, it says, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Uh, I can already tell I don't want to be this person. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? Answer, they that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. Like today, they talk about mixed drinks. Uh, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. The Lord tells you not, people talk about, well, it's okay for a Christian drink. Look, God doesn't, even, God doesn't just say not to drink the liquor. He says, don't even look at it. I mean, you talk about a teetotaler. That's uh, even a step beyond. Don't even look at the fermented liquor. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. A serpent like the devil. The devil gets into the drink and it stings. It has a bad effect on you. And so you want to avoid that because I don't think that you want to be, I mean, I mean, would you, would you, would you just go out just for fun and say, I'm going to see if I can find me a serpent that'll bite me. I want to go out and I want to, I want to get a sting from a snake. I want them, I want them to just sink his teeth into me. We don't go out looking for that stuff. But spiritually people do just, they just don't know it because that's what the drink does at the last. Of course, people don't think, they don't, they don't take the long look. You've got to take the long look for your actions. You've got to look beyond the immediate pleasure your action is going to give you and think beyond what am I going to feel like afterward? What's going to happen to me afterward? What are the consequences going to be? Take the long look and keep yourself out of trouble. At the last, that's the problem. Uh, and he says, verse 33. Now, here's where it's, you can see it specifically affecting morality. In verse 33, thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Thine eyes shall behold strange women. Uh, that's somebody who's, what he's taken in his mouth, in the drink, affects what his eyes are going to look at as far as uh, moral things. Thine eyes shall behold strange women. It affects what's going on in his heart. Thine heart shall utter perverse things. It tunes him in morally to the wrong morality, to immorality. Verse 34, yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. We can get like feel like seasick until he loses his cookies and <laughs> throws up. Verse 35, they have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. This guy, the drink affects him so badly, and yet he gets up and he still can't say no to it. He goes right back after it again. Um, it's been said about uh, liquor with people taking it, it kind of goes like this. It says uh, a little three lines says, man takes drink, drink takes drink, drink takes man. So man takes a drink and, and before long, you know, the drink wants more drink. And so then the drink, you know, keeps them drinking. And then eventually the drink takes the man. Nobody that, nobody that's an alcoholic starts out to be an alcoholic. Matter of fact, they probably said, I'm, I'm never going to be an alcoholic. Some people grew up around it and saw relatives that were alcoholics and said, I'm never going to be like that. But then they went out and started drinking. And before long, they're just like it. Once that stuff gets a hold of you, the addictive properties of it, and all sin is addictive, will, will take you right down unless, by the grace of God, you know you, you intervene with good sense or some, something else happens. Somebody else intervenes with you, and you, you, you're eventually going to have to have good sense yourself and make the right decision. So go to um, Isaiah chapter number 5, Isaiah 5, talking about the effect that drink has on a person's morality. And when I talk again about morality, I'm talking about both your behavior and your outlook, what you think about right and wrong. And when we're talking about that, it's what you think about the Lord. Look at Isaiah 5, verse 11. Woe unto them. Now, look, you don't want to be in the rest of the verse where he's saying woe unto them. You don't want to be that crowd. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink. Here's liquor again. That continue until night till wine inflame them. And the harp and the vial and the tabret and pipe and wine are in their feast, but... They regard not the work of the Lord, 
neither consider the operation of his hands. These people here, they don't want anything to do with the Lord. Why? Because getting drunk and living righteous don't go together. You may have religions that incorporate drink as part of their religion, or the religion may say it's okay, but, it, but drinking does not lend itself to, to good moral living. It lends itself to bad immoral living. And God says in regard to this, the, the folks don't regard the work of the Lord, they've been drinking, he says in verse 13, therefore my people, his own people were taken, taken in by this, therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. They're just ignorant. They're, and their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure in their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoices shall descend into it. And that's just um, right there. That behavior just takes a person's life right down to hell. And that's not where you want to wind up. And if you're saved, I understand you're eternally secure, but you don't want your life to become a living hell on this earth. Like many people claim that their lives are. And you, you get talking to some folks, messed around, they're messed around, and they've got sin in their lives, and they're all messed up with sin, and their life's a mess. And uh, you hear them, they talk and they complain. And then you're off from Jesus. And some of them say, you know, no, I, I don't want that. I'm having too much fun. <laughs> what are you talking about both sides of your mouth? What, what is it, fun or is your life a mess? <laughs> it's a mess. They keep trying to soothe it with the uh, placebos of the sins of this world that give them some, some temporary pleasure uh, of, this, of sin for a season. All right, so there is something that will that can be taken into the body and, and will cause you not to think right morally and not to behave right morally. I want to show you something in the scriptures, um, amazingly, that you can take into your body that will help you to make good moral decisions and, and live a good moral life. It will assist you in your efforts to do right. It can affect your morality for good. It's also in the book of Isaiah, and maybe a page or so over from where you're at, We'll look at Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah 7, verse 15. Watch the Lord's words, what he says. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. That's a wild thought. But according to that, verse right there, this butter and this honey, as he eats it, and, and we know the Bible speaks a lot in particular about honey and, and the, the effect that it has. It's also likened to the scriptures, but he's talking about literally eating this stuff, and that will allow him to refuse the evil and choose the good. And by the way, he's talking about um, a, a young person. Notice in verse 16, for before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good. And, and so he's talking about eating that. And so Whatever you think about honey, whether you like it or not, here's what God says. It's just it's God's sweetener. It's an amazing substance. Again, talked a little bit about that in the message last week, but not from this perspective. But by partaking of that, by eating it, it can literally help you to make wise decisions. Wisdoms like in the, the honey as well. But it can help you to make wise moral decisions. It can help you to look at refuse the evil. It help you to say no to sin. Choose the good. Help you to say yes to righteousness. Um. If I, if I were uh, looking for an assist to doing right, I'd try to implement this. I'd, I'd just experiment with it. By the way, what's even, this is amazing, I think. Look at the context of this. There's a more familiar verse right before verse 15. It's a prophecy about Jesus. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he, that's Jesus, that he may know to refuse evil and choose a good. He's God in the flesh. But he knew what to, to eat. He knew what was going to help him. And that was uh, butter and honey. You can get the same assist that Jesus got to do right by just partaking of that miraculous substance that the Lord made uh, called honey. Health-giving properties galore, as well as spiritual health-giving properties. All right, so 
we'll leave you to chew on that for a little while or, or let it dissolve in your mouth. Let me give you one last thing tonight that can affect your morality for good or bad. And the last thing I want, that I want to tell you about is your music. Your music can affect your um, morality for good or it can affect your morality for bad. S skip back to chapter 5 of Isaiah. Along with the strong drink, notice there was music involved. Verse number 11. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that may follow strong drink, that continue until night to wine and flame them, and the harp, musical instrument, and the vial, etc., uh, and tabret, the tabret and pipe, and wine. The harp, vial, tabret, and pipe were musical musical instruments of the day, which we have you know today as well. But um, those things were in their feast, and and along with the wine, they contributed to them not wanting anything to do with the Lord. Now go to the book of Job, where Job will show the connection even more strongly when it just comes to music. Chapter 21, Job 21. And in Job 21, look at verse number 11. Job 21, verse 11. They send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. Unfortunately, the parents were sending them out for this. They take the timbrel. Here comes musical instruments again. They take, take the timbrel and harp and rejoice at the sound of the organ. They spend their days in wealth and in a moment go down to the grave. Well, that is descriptive of so many of the uh, world's music uh, icons that did that. They became famous, spent in wealth, lived like the devil, and then just that quick, boom, they, they died. So they spend their days in wealth and in a moment go down to the grave. Now, with this music background here that they're talking about, they got the music, they got the dancing and all that going on. In verse 14, he says, therefore, the therefore connecting it to what he was talking about in the previous verses. Therefore, they say unto God, depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. One of the things that makes it um, so difficult for us even to deal with this lost world is they are programmed to reject the truth of God when they hear it. And one of the things that programs them to do it is the music they listen to. After I got saved, I, um, you know, I, I cleaned out a lot of things from my life. And uh, one of the things was the music. And I began, as, as my head began to air out and begin to think clearly, I began to look at how I thought before I was... Um, saved and, and the philosophies that I was embracing. Cause you know, you get these ideas and thoughts and stuff that you're going to, that you think about and kind of creeds that you live by, or um, at least profess you live by, but, you, but this is kind of the direction you're headed. And I was amazed to find out that so much of what I was thinking came from the lyrics of the songs that I had been listening to. And it was just, and now I got out of that stuff and into the Bible and began to think differently. But that music will affect you, with or without words, by the way. But the words just uh, make it uh, doubly dangerous. And, some, and sometimes the music, it, it, it takes down your spiritual defenses for the words then to begin to preach to your mind different things, and then you begin to think like that. But here, let's, not, let's get back to the passage, and don't miss what the Lord's telling you right here. They got the timbrel, the harp, they got the organ, all those music. They're spending their days in wealth, like, you know, uh, uh, and going down the grave in a moment like rock stars. Therefore, they say unto God, depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. What is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit should we have if we pray unto him? That's how they're thinking. That's how a lot of this world is thinking. They think, what, what, why should we serve God? What good is that? What's it going to do me? What profit am I going to have? Um, let it depart from us, and and they get pretty bad. They get pretty, I remember talking to one guy kid years ago. Um, how many of you remember the Lockport Mall? <laughs> Did you know we used to have a, a, a mall in Lockport? Say, where is it now? Walmart <laughs> taking up all the space, except for on the end of it was the Bonton, which now is that um Cube Smart or something. Uh, that was the other side of the mall. But um, I remember talking to, I, I was driving through the parking lot there one time and, uh, and I saw a, a kid, uh, a couple kids on a bicycle, uh, began to talk with them and witness to him. One was a younger kid, one was an older kid. 
And um, man, the older kid was just so anti-God. When talking about the Bible, he said, burn it. And he'd been listening to, um, I think it was Marilyn Manson he'd been listening to, who apparently burned Bibles or whatever, I don't know, you know, showmanship, but uh, but just lost, full of the devil. And and he just was so anti-God. Finally, I, I said to the young young kid, I said, does your mom know that you're hanging out with this guy? <laughs> but but that was his idea. Depart from us. We desire not the knowledge of thy ways. And, and some of them are overt like that, and other times it's just more subtle. And, and people just reject it, like a drowning man trying to fight off somebody that's trying to save him from drowning. And they depart from us. We don't, we don't want to know about this. Leave us alone. And you got a world that's filled with their own worldly, ungodly music that just by, by the influence it has on them, find themselves rejecting the truth. And this is the stuff you got to break through. How do you break through it? It takes the power of God to do it. I mean, his word, his power, his spirit. So these things, the music can have a, such a bad effect on people <clears throat> that it causes them not to want to do anything with the Lord. By the way, if you're saved and you're listening to the wrong music, that holds you back spiritually. It puts a strong, it puts a choke hold on you. It's like um, it's like a serpent, it's like a bow constrictor, just wraps it around, wraps around you and slowly begins to um, tighten itself. Uh, I remember a point in, in uh, my life, I was saved, and I had some music I was listening to, you know, I started listening to from the old days and uh, and enjoyed it. And and yet, you know, and then then there came something that happened, and I just realized, you know what, I, I need the Lord's help. I need the Lord's blessing. I probably shouldn't be listening to this. And I made a break, and I, uh, you know, you know, got it right with the Lord. And I'm going to tell you, it was like the constriction just began to lose. <laughs> I was free. <laughs> that stuff takes you down, folks. It takes you down. Not only can bad music take you down, but um, the good news is good music can take you up. And, and it can affect you morally for good. Go to 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. First Samuel 16, verse 14. Saul got in a bad way, and it says here in verse 14, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee, that our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is a cunning player on an harp. And it shall come to pass, when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. Uh, they seem to think that the music could affect Saul for good spiritually. Let's see if they're right. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing, um, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son, uh, which, is with, uh, which is with the sheep. So the, he, he does. He sends uh, David to him. And look at verse 21. And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he, he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And, um, and Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. That, uh, that music affected Saul uh, for good because it was good music. It was good uh, harp music from David, spiritual music, this called later the sweet psalmist of Israel. And as David played with that harp, Saul was three things. He was refreshed. It refreshed his spirit. He was well. Which, which indicates it also had a good physical effect on him because the music the vibe music is a bunch of vibrations that that can affect the body and the way it you know works and it was well it's very interesting too in, in our um, uh, our King James Bible now some of you might have, have an updated spelling but a lot of King James Bible have an old spelling of music that's spelled M U S I C K. And uh, I just find that interesting with sick at the end of it because it can make you sick 
or it could make you better. Anyway, Saul was refreshed and was well. And then uh, most importantly, for what we're talking about tonight in the realm of, of uh, morality, the evil spirit departed from him. And Saul, when the evil spirit was upon him, you know, he didn't do so well. You remember when he tried to kill David later on, toss a javelin at him? But, uh, but here, the evil spirit departed from him. So good music can help disconnect you from evil spirits. That's a powerful thing. Um, it, it's kind of uh, on a level, uh, sort of, with uh, the Word of God itself, which is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit. It can divide between those things. And uh, the music works on a similar, uh, in a similar way, in a similar level. Go with me to 2 Kings. Not only can it help the evil spirits to depart, but good music can help the Spirit of the Lord to come upon you. 2 Kings chapter 14. I'm sorry, chapter 3. 2 Kings chapter 3. We're just in uh, verse 14 of, of uh, 1 Samuel 16. But I want 2 Kings chapter 3, and we're going to look there at verse 15. And this um, is Elisha the prophet. As uh, he speaks, you see in verse 14. But verse 15, he says this, And now bring me a minstrel. That's somebody's going to be playing music. Now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. The hand of the Lord came upon him with the good music. So good music can separate the evil spirits from you and, and make way for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. This is something that you have control over, largely. You have control over the music that you listen to. You might find yourself in some uh, situations where, where you don't. You at a store or something, and it's just it's imposed upon you, or somebody drives by with the car too loud. You know, you got to turn you you're trying to turn your good music up to drown that out or something. But um, but but by and large, we choose what we listen to, for good or for bad. The music, and you can help get the devil out of your life and the Lord in your life more. By if you got bad music, cutting out the bad music, and uh, also the good music helps both of those things. And, and by, 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 just like good music helps the evil spirit to depart, bad music helps the evil spirit to come upon you and, and just to take root. Uh, so that's why the scripture says this um, Wherefore, be not un unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Get, get good music in your life. Get bad music out of your life. Um, recognize if there's certain things that you eat that make it harder for you to do right, and, uh, and, and try replacing them with some things that are better. And, and don't forget to try God's magnificent, miraculous food, honey, that helps you not only physically, but make good moral decisions. And... You know, don't worry about the fact that you have to spend money for it. You go in there and say, well, it's so expensive. You wouldn't worry about it if it was a bag of chips, right? A box of candy bars. And, and the honey will last longer. So it's a good investment. So your friends and companions, your diet, your music, all of that can help you or hurt you. They can affect you uh, and your morality. So there's probably something in there that can help you in your life starting right away. And now it's just up to you to do something about it. Let's pray. Lord, I, I thank you for the light the scriptures give us. I pray you'd help us to take these things to heart. I pray, Lord, as we um, contemplate them and, and take a little time to consider them and, and pray during the invitation. Um, if needs be, Lord, you, you just speak strongly to somebody's heart, but just certainly make it plain and clear what things that we might be allowing in our lives that are hindering us along these lines and help us to make the adjustment, uh, Lord, to make the good choices uh, to benefit from uh, your blessings and get those blessings upon us. Lord, thank you that there are things that we can do. Help us to do them. Help us to be wise and be merciful to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We'll have um, the music play. Let's take some time. Talk to the Lord.
Amen. Thank you, Lord, for a good day in church, uh, starting with Sunday school, Lord, morning service, um, uh, the, the time we had to uh, Lord, partake of uh, the Lord's Supper even this morning and uh, the fellowship with your people. Uh, Lord, the, the message and the, the time together tonight, time to sing, Lord, to you. Uh, it's been a good day, and we thank you for that. And I pray that you'd help us to go forth, Lord, in the strength of uh, what you ministered us uh, this week. And uh, let us make a difference, Lord, for, for God and for good in this whole world. And make a difference, Lord, even in our own lives, by our own choices and decisions. I pray you use us and help us to shine, Lord, as lights in this dark world. And, uh, and give us wisdom, Lord, to behave uh, in wise manners. And help us to take, again, some of these things, put them into action, whatever it might be, follow up, and, uh, and let, the, let the truth bring forth fruit in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.